this is this is this is What's up, you guys? What is up? Uh, it is February twelfth, Monday. A nice day, I guess. I don't know. What are, what are you guys up to? We had a great weekend in New York and Philadelphia. Thank you. MXPX live dates coming up. Atlanta, March fifteenth. Atlanta, Buckhead Theater. MXPX in the Ataris, and then March sixteenth, Orlando House of Blues, Orlando. MXPX in the Ataris. So, check it out. If you want to be part of the podcast, please call in. Uh, it's 360-830-6660. So it starts with three. So 360-830-6660. Call in, leave a voicemail, leave me a message. Let me know how it's going. But I want to hear you know questions, comments, topics, ideas, anything concise, anything interesting. I'd love to hear from you. Ladies, we don't hear enough from you. Please call in. Uh, if you just went to the show in New York or Philly, please call in and, and tell me what's up. Say, hey, I was just in the show and I loved this or whatever. Like, tell me about your experience. Did you have pizza? Where did you eat it? When did you go to the show? Would do, how were the Ataris? And what were some of your favorite songs we played? And what was, yeah, what was your favorite part of the night? Like, I would love to hear anything like that if, if uh, any of you callers... Or, or first, you know, maybe never callers want to want to call in with a story. I'd love that. But the people that call in often, oh, I love that too. So don't stop calling just because you've called a few times because uh, I love hearing from you. So that's just that's become a, a big part of this podcast when I don't have guests and when I'm uh, it, mainly I find myself doing these episodes when I'm busy, which is half the year, pretty much. Um, but. I really love doing it because I get to hear from you directly and, and I get to hear your stories and I get to have, hear your questions and try to bring some insight into things that we really don't get to talk about in videos and in, um, you know, normal MXPX land because MXPX is not only in the present and the future. We really don't like to over celebrate the past because we want people to know what we're doing now, you know, and um, we can celebrate the past together at shows, come out to a show. It's nostalgia city. Uh, we love it. It's so much fun, but we also have new stuff, and we're doing we're doing songs different. We play better than we've ever played before. We have a better uh, we have a better show, live show than we've ever had. You know, we're just always trying to push the envelope and and still stay within what MXPX is, um, and and that might vary to a lot of people, right? Like some people might think MXPX is one thing, and and others think it's another. So. I'm not here to dissuade you of your ideas, your stories, but I do I do feel like living like a dog, meaning in the present, is important for any anybody that wants to do things that matter now and will matter in the future. Because if we're only serving nostalgia, and like I said, we serve nostalgia plenty at the shows, but if we're only serving nostalgia on our social media, like per se, right? Then people are just going to expect that only. Now, if we're serving people new, fresh, new music, new video, they're going to expect new stuff as well. You know, they're going to they're going to enjoy the old stuff because they know it, but they're also going to expect new. So that's the philosophy, you know that that. Uh, that I didn't mean to even talk about, but, uh, you know, that's the philosophy, you know, of, of just being able to talk about uh, things on this podcast that I wouldn't normally talk about on social media all the time, which is, you know, the past, which is stories from the past. MXPX tour stories, uh, w you know, whatever, right? But uh, Fixer Upper story, you know, people ask me about all sorts of things, but um, – the the podcast is really the place I can I can kind of be a little more free to delve into those things. So if you want to hear about that stuff, no problem. At the same time, uh, even this podcast, I still have I still have that I don't know that structure of not wanting to live too far into the past. Like it's great to reminisce and tell stories. I love it, and I'm gonna probably do it on this podcast. I don't listen to the voicemails before. I'm just literally going down lists. And as long as as long as there's nothing too crazy about them, they they end up on the podcast. But um, yeah, it's a freedom. I love it. But but 
there's still a structure because I can't necessarily only talk about the past. I need to talk about the shows coming up. You know, we, we have uh, Atlanta, we have Orlando. I'm going to have some friends from the past coming out to Orlando and Atlanta, uh, different people. Uh, but my buddy Louis D. Fabrizio, he's going to be in, he was, he was in New York as well, but, uh, he should be anyway. Um, he, he's coming out to, uh, to Florida and he's always a good time. Cause he's not only a musician, people love him, but he's just an old time friend of ours. Like we've just spent so much time on tour together. I've slept at his house. I worked for him for a day. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I worked for I, I worked as a move a mover. Now, back in 2011, 2012, somewhere in there, I did a tour with Lewis, and it was a solo acoustic tour. It was before I worked with Tom Tachilla. It was like a whole different. I, I didn't even have a manager at that point. I don't think. Maybe MXPX did, but I didn't, but back then it was like separated. It wasn't, it wasn't like now our management sort of, it, it manages all, all of my being pretty much, uh, including Goldfinger. But, uh, and, and back, back then it was management that managed MXPX. And then I did my own stuff separately. And I even had a separate booking agent and all that. Uh, and I booked my own stuff on the side all the time, as well as having a separate uh, tumble down booking agent. So, uh, what ended up happening is I just get, you know, I, I book a tour with Lewis and Lewis has a booking agent and he's like, all right, here's some dates, blah, 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 blah. Let's go. Now, well, I didn't, it wasn't a great money deal or anything. Like we didn't like make a killing, but we made enough to, to live. But those were the, uh, the, the dark days, the dark days of music and touring and, it was still the dark days. Uh, all throughout the tum the tumble down days were the dark days, really. And um, what I mean by that is there wasn't streaming yet. It was just Napster. It was people were getting music for free, and people weren't buying CDs. They weren't buying music. The, the vinyl wasn't big yet again. So people weren't going to shows either. People were also not really going. It was weird. It was like. It was really hard. I think it was people weren't going to shows, not that they didn't want to go to the shows. They were going to shows that were well promoted. And there was no real way to promote back then on your own. It was you needed a big company. You needed a lot of money. And because of that, when I was doing like indie solo acoustic stuff, they, they were just like the smallest of the, I mean, a couple hundred people, things like that, you know, even less on some. Um, and it was fun, but I started back to Lewis, you know, Lewis and I were playing together at all these places. We played the, um, the milestone in, in North Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, the milestone Raleigh. No, it's not Raleigh. I don't know where it is, but it's in, it's in the Carolinas and it's called the milestone and I don't know if it's still there, but we played there and it was one of the, the most fun shows I've ever had. Like it was so much fun. All the people were great, but just the atmosphere of the place was great. And, um, you know, all those people knew MX, they were MXPX fans from back in the day. And, and so like they knew all the songs I was singing and, and, they were digging some of the, you know, I did some tumble down stuff too, and they might, might not have known that stuff, but they were digging that. Of course, they're all kind of country punkers, and um, I just remember at the end of the end of the set, Lewis came out and was like either playing tambourine or like he got on the drum set. There was a drum set behind me, and he doesn't really play drums, and he was very drunk, but it was still the best time ever. It was just like. We're just kind of just making it happen, and and all the people like right around you, and there's a photo from there's photos from that that uh that that show. I think there are. Um, I need to get my hands on those. But those are good times, you know. Like starting that tour, I flew to New York, met up with Lewis, slept at his house, but I flew in a day early and decided it was a good idea to work for him for a day. 
And so I worked for his moving company as one of the grunts that would just a mover. I was a moving guy for one day and we got up early, went straight at it. We went, you know, this brownstone in Brooklyn, it's just like up these stairs, up like three flights of stairs and um, just taking stuff into the truck. It was just like, this is it. This is what you do. Like towards the end of the day, we're, we're somewhere more like in Manhattan or something like that. And, and we're like carrying all this stuff into this super old, huge building. Like it looks like it could have been like a, a school, but like it had way too much style, like a hotel almost. But it was completely empty and full of tile. Anyway, uh, that was a hard, long day. And, and I had the best time. Like you felt so good because you're doing an honest day's work. And I think, I don't know what I got that day, like three or five hundred bucks, three to five hundred bucks, something like that. Maybe it was four, four fifty or something. Lewis, Lewis just handed me a, just a little wad of cash. And then uh, they slept on his couch that night and um, we were out the next day. We we uh, well, we had a show. Actually, we weren't out the next day. I was I know I was hung over one day. And sleeping on his couch most of the day. That's how that tour started as well. It must have been after. It must have been after the the show. We we must have had a show or something, you know, because we did have a show in New York. Um, really nice place, really cool, little mini theater, and I don't remember the name of the spot, but it was it was cool. I'm sure those dates can be found. Uh, really small little little like a place a stand up comedian might do. Um, but it was real hip and really a great vibe. Um, maybe it was after that I got hung over like the next day, but anyway, like we had, I had a day in New York where I was just like not doing well. And then we left on the tour. Um, and we, we headed South. We went all through, like I said, the milestone in the Carolinas and we went to like Huntington, uh, West Virginia. We played there played in Orlando. That was one of our best shows was in Orlando, Florida. Um, great crowd, great spot. It was really cool. Um, and we, we headed west from there. We headed west and, and did like Tallahassee, I think. We played a show there. It wasn't the best turnout. It was a weird night. It probably was like a Tuesday night in Tallahassee. So it was like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> but like back in those days, like I said, it was already hard to get people to come out to shows and to, to know you what you were doing. And I wasn't normally doing acoustic tours. So like it was kind of new for me. And I still don't really do a lot of acoustic tours. I'll do acoustic shows here and there. And they've gone well over the last few years, but or not even the last few years. I haven't done them in the last few years. Um, but when I was doing them before the pandemic hit, they were up to like, you know, I, I don't know what the counts were, but five to a thousand, 500 to a thousand, you know, maybe it was like 500 people, uh, three to 500 people. That's more realistic. But um, yeah, I remember those Texas shows I did. I have a live, I mean, my career live in Texas. Um, I guess a 10 inch, it's a 10 inch vinyl. It's available in our, in our web store. And those places I played, you know, I played Houston and I played the, the Kessel. Maybe that was Houston or, and then DF, I played Dallas um, and I played, I'm not sure which one the Kessel was, but one of them and then another theater. And it was just, they were beautiful theaters. So uh, you would never want to see a punk show at a place like this. And I would want to do a punk show at a place like this because it's too nice. You're going to ruin things. Punk shows, of course, should be in clubs and theaters and things like that. But even even uh, New York City, that place is super nice. You know, if it's when it's empty, you see the room. Uh, Webster Hall, where MXP just played, super nice. And um, but not as nice as these places. Not these places in Dallas were just beautiful, like works of art. Um, that reminds me of when we were touring with with uh, Dashboard Confessional. We played. The Aragon Ballroom, I think. Was the Aragon in Chicago? Or was that Cleveland? Um, I think it's I think it's Chicago. Whatever the we we did that both of them. Let's put let's put it that way. We did both of them, but there was a huge one we did in Chicago that 
was bigger than what we would normally do in Chicago for on our for our headlining stuff for sure. And 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 back in the day, obviously we played even smaller venues. We played we played like well we played House of Blues size venues back then, but we didn't really play bigger venues like we would do now. And we didn't headline festivals like we would do now. So things have de- definitely grown since then. But um, yeah, those venues were beautiful opening for Dashboard. I know I'm bouncing around a little bit. Um, that's how I do. But I was just thinking about beautiful venues. Um, what is that place in Chicago? It's like in South Chicago, in a Mexican neighborhood. And some of the place, some of the like rest dressing rooms upstairs are abandoned and like blocked off. Uh, I'm sure by now they've maybe been redone, but at the time, really bad. This the place was beautiful, but at the same time, the sound wasn't super great. It was very boomy, very boomy. Um, but you know, sometimes that happens. E- even like we played Seattle. Um, uh, it was on, I don't remember which tour this was. I think it was, it wasn't Simple Plan because Simple Plan, when we had, we co- we did a co-headliner with Simple Plan uh, in Canada and the U.S. And that was, we played, we played the Paramount Theater. But then when we co-headlined a tour with Reliant K, did we play, where did we play? Where did we play? I don't remember. I don't remember. Maybe it was the Paramount again, but I think it might have been. Um, it might have been. I'm trying to think. I'm just pulling this out of my brain. The Seattle Exhibition Center, which I don't know what it's called. I, I don't know what it was called then, but I think it was called that. It was like the Seattle Exhibition Center. It's right next to where the Seahawks play. It's actually attached to. It's attached to the stadium where the Seahawks play. So we played there with somebody. Was it The Offspring? No, 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 no. We played there with somebody. And it might have been co-headlining with Reliant K. Um, I don't know. Somebody remembers that. No, that might have been Dashboard. Honestly, that might have been the Dashboard tour. Huh. Wow. Okay. All right. Let's get to your... <laughs> Who knows? We just went down memory lane. And uh, we found that the details are very hazy. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh let's hear from you guys um your voicemails right here yeah uh mike jenkins cincinnati uh longtime fan first caller uh was curious about uh the cooties album some of the deeper cuts on that have you know seen you uh play on the quarantine and uh some of the other live stuff you did on the internet, uh, I guess some deeper cuts, but really hadn't seen anything from the cooties get on there. And, uh, one track I've always liked on there was, uh, the one Mike's waiting Mm -hmm. with my name being Mike. It was something I had kind of connected to back in the day and was just curious if, you know, that's one you guys would ever cover in any sense of the word. Uh, I guess was, also thinking about the riff at the start of that song it sounded a little bit like something that could be on Buffalo. Uh, so I was curious if there was any parallel there with that guitar riff at the start and some of the, uh, you know, maybe later songs that evolved from that. So anyway, I was curious if you guys would ever uh, cover anything from the cooties beyond the kind of the normal ones you already did off that. Uh, thanks a lot. Talk to you later. Bye. Thanks for the call, Mike. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I might, I don't know. I just never really thought too much about it. Mike's Waiting is definitely a song that, that we could do because Tom really loves that song. Um, you mentioned the riff. It's just, I just wrote a riff. I mean, it has nothing to do with anything, any album really. It's just, I wrote the song, but. Yeah, yeah, man. It's like you know, Mike's waiting. It's just another love song and another idea I came up with. But um, I dig it, man. I dig that song a lot, actually. And there's 
when we were doing that live with the Cooties, it was really cool because, you know, Giles was playing bass and Giles was a great bass player. Um, not a great singer, but, you know, it was early days. You know, it's like, who knows? Who knows what would have happened if he would have stuck with it, stayed a good human, like things like that. Um, but, you know, we were kids. We didn't know how, how to sing. I didn't know how to sing. And so when I sing, when I when I see like young bands and they're off key singing, I go, okay, maybe the as long as they're not off key the whole time, like you got to have something. But you can develop that. And sometimes you just can't hear yourself on stage, and the monitors are really bad, and you're just singing out. Um, and sometimes the frequency or the note sounds different in your ears. Your ears compress after a while live. And there's there's times where I have a hard time hearing the tone, the pitch of what's going on so I can sing to it. That's the worst. When you, when you finally can hear, oh, that's the tone. That's the key. I've been singing eh, up here or down here, whatever. Now I got to get it. I got to get it on, you know? So anyway, uh, cooties though. <laughs> cooties is, uh, that was just fun. That was just like all fun songs. We gave no thought to it. It was, it was, it was it was also kind of like how MX Peaks was a long time ago too, giving no thought to it. Um, nowadays, it's definitely different when I write songs nowadays. I'm not I'm not picking names out of a hat like we did with the Cooties, um, but the the mechanics are basically the same. I mean, I you have an idea for a song, you sit down, have an instrument. Me usually it's a guitar, acoustic guitar. Sometimes it's a bass, sometimes it's an electric guitar, sometimes it's a piano, but usually it's acoustic guitar or it's just me by myself with a phone, right? Phone recording voice memos so I can get the ideas down, get the melody down, get the word down, whatever. But that has always been how I've written is just I have the idea. I used to write it on paper. Now I write it, if it's lyrics, I write it on my notes app and I've got lyrics and i'll put the date and you know there's some lyrics boom, boom, boom and then like when i go to write a song uh or or if i don't have an idea for a song i can go to that to that page look for some ideas oh yeah i wanted to write that okay i didn't have time because i was busy doing something else so i wrote it down for later i mean that's that's a huge tool for me as a songwriter is being able to have an idea get it down somehow and then come back to it when I have more time to really think about it. So I think in that way, songwriting's changed the most is I used to just have the idea and write the song. But now I have the idea, but maybe my kid's right there. Like, do you know how much I love you? All of it. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, really, it's great, babe. Writing that down. And <laughs> that, that's just life changes and you kind of have to adapt how you do things. But like the fundamentals of my songwriting is still idea okay now i have time to sit down and think about it i'm gonna put it on guitar i'm gonna da, 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 oh yeah that's my part okay da, 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 da. i'm going to you know whatever all right so that's how i write songs it's just come up with the idea record it come back to it later develop it keep working and i know i went way off of your question yeah, sure, I would do. I, I like my favorites off of the Cooties record is uh, Mike's Waiting is one of them. But Blank, love that song. Shut Up, love that song. And then I would say Roses Are Red. Roses Are Red's rad. Just Roses Are Red, Violets Are Blue. I was all alone till I found you. I don't even remember the rest of it. But like, I at one point, I, I, I wanted to cover it. And, and MXPX did cover it. Cover it. Um, which, which brings me to I'm okay. You're okay. Now I'm okay. You're okay. Came out on the cooties album. And then, but that was my song. I wrote it. I'm a singer, I'm a guitar player. So like when you hear cooties, if it's somebody else singing, that means they probably wrote the lyrics. So when I'm singing, I wrote the lyrics and that's not a hundred percent on the record, but for the most part, it's like that. Uh, dirty punk. Uh, I wrote most of that song, but Giles wrote a lot of the lyrics. Um, but I don't remember who sings what, you know? So, like, he might have wrote in some of the lyrics that I'm singing on that chorus and vice versa on the verse. So 
Um, don't really remember, but Giles wrote, you know, me and Giles wrote most of those songs. And then, but I wrote most of the songs, but I'm okay, you're okay. Uh, I got to say, shout out to Dale too, because he wrote a couple of those songs and he's a great guitar player, great songwriter, decent singer, and now a great drummer. He's been playing for the Fibs for, you know, I don't know how long they've been a band, almost 10 years or, or more, probably more. But um, he plays drums for the Fibs here in Bremerton, and uh, they're great. Um, a cool local band, local rock band. But he's gotten good. Anyway, back to I'm Okay, You're Okay. I mean, that was, the Cooters were so new, and they were literally just a side project of MXPX. MXPX was touring and doing all this stuff, and when I wrote that song, when, when everybody heard it, they're like, dude, this is, this is a great song. Let's do this for MXPX. So we all just wanted to do it for MXPX because we we wanted to to put good songs where people could hear them. And guaranteed, if if we never put I'm Okay, You're Okay out, no one would know I'm Okay, You're Okay. They wouldn't know it from the Cooties because nobody knows any other Cooties songs. They know I'm Okay, You're Okay. So it's my band, my rules, Right. But I don't know. Do you guys disagree? Did I cover the song and it's not mine to put on the MXPX record? I'd love love to hear your thoughts. Not that it's going to change my mind. But, uh, you know, when you have an idea, it's your idea. Spread it out. I mean, there's a good example of that. Uh, Imagine Dragons. They have their hits, their first hit song. And I know they have multiple hit songs now, but their first hit song... I can't remember what it's called, but it it gets stuck in your head. It's a really great song. But that song came out like three times. They put it on their first album. They put it on their second album. They put it on their third album. And finally, it became a huge hit. And then the band itself became huge. And I'm not saying I want to put I'm Okay, You're Okay on every album, but it's clear that Sometimes things deserve a second chance, and that one de- definitely did. Back in the day, uh, artists would always do covers, like Johnny Cash would write a song, and jo- Bob Dylan would cover it. And Bob Dylan would write a song, and Johnny Cash would cover it. it but they would also do the, the other thing, where Johnny Cash writes the song for Bob Dylan and Bob Dylan plays it, but then Johnny Cash covers his song that he wrote. So is it a cover if he wrote it? Well, people see it as a cover because Bob Dylan made it famous and then he made it famous in the country sense maybe and vice versa, right? I'm talking about like, it ain't me, babe. No, 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 it ain't me, babe. It ain't me you're looking for, babe. That, I'm pretty sure Bob Dylan wrote that song. But Johnny Cash does it great. Am I wrong? I could be wrong. It could be the other way around because it's just so, who knows, right? Certainly, that's very cool. And this is nothing like that. It's not as cool as that. It's just me wanting my song to get out there. Like, hey, let's do this. This is good. This is a good song. Like, like what if I wrote Let's Ride and Stay Up All Night on a, like from Tumble Down, you know? Might want to do it with MXPX because nobody hears Tumble Down. Nobody's going to listen to Tumble Down. So um, it's just, it makes sense. It makes sense. But um, I would love to hear if anybody absolutely hates this idea of the fact that it's not a, I don't think it's a cover. It's my song. So I'm not covering my own song. Um, I'm playing my song. There you go. You know what I mean? Like, but I get what you mean by, by that. But I'm just being. Uh, a little bit on the spectrum here. I'm being very, I'm being a stickler when it comes to the words people use in relation to what I'm doing and living, you know, how I'm performing in songs and this and that. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, my, it's my podcast prerogative. My, uh, <laughs> my prerogative. I don't know. Bobby Brown in the house. What's up? What's up? Man. All right. Bobby Brown passed away. I'm sure he did. I think he did. Did he? I know Whitney Houston did. R.I.P. Love Whitney. Um, But at this point, I can't remember who, I mean, who hasn't or who has, like, a lot of tragedy in that family. So, anyway, let's get to the next caller. 
Hey, Mike, this is Ben from Stockton, California. I just wanted to call in and give a couple questions here. Uh, I was curious. I know you said recently you had upgraded the studio, kind of revamped things. I thought it would be kind of cool if you guys or if you did a uh, YouTube video, kind of like a studio tour, studio tour for uh, the gearheads out there listening. I uh, thought that would be pretty cool. And then I had a question. Uh, I know you guys started in the early 90s, so you kind of got to live and see the transition from analog to digital recording. And if you got any cool stories, you know, about analog, digital, whatever, you know, maybe some mishaps back in the analog days. Uh, yeah, thanks. Again, that was Ben from Stockton, and uh look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. What up, what up? Right on, man. Nice to hear from you. Um so Ben, let's talk about let's talk about studio stuff. Yes, I can do some sort of revamp video. I don't know if I'm going to get too technical into the stuff because one, I just don't care to spend that much time on it. But also two, I don't know. I feel weird about people seeing everything I have. Um, but the revamp thing—that's a great idea, and I I have kind of a journey because we. We got rid of the console that we ha currently are, are re <laughs> revamping. Um, we got rid of it because it was just it wasn't working and it wasn't reliable. A lot of the channels were dead, and so we took it out. It wasn't actually, you know, it was it was Rick's console, Rick, uh, who is our studio manager type tech guy, and it was his console. And I had sold my Neotech, and so he put his his uh, ghost. Uh, well, I guess it's a, yeah, Soundcraft, not Ghost. It's a Soundcraft 1500. 1500, I think that's the number, uh, what it is. So it's a really cool, great sounding console, but it just, it wasn't working. So he, he had put that in there for a couple of years. And, and then when it wasn't working, we took it out. I put this Midas, um, I don't know, kind of like a live console because I wanted it for the live stream stuff. And we just ultimately weren't really happy with that. And last year we decided let's revamp the studio. And so here we are revamping the studio. We're trying to get this new console all fixed up. So we got the same console. We bought it instead of it being Rick's. Rick sold it to somebody and then we bought it from that somebody. We Rick convinced him to sell it and he's like i'll find you another console i know this one has issues we're going to send it in we're going to get every channel fixed up we're going to make it squeaky clean and that's what we're in the process of doing right now so once that's done which would should be fairly soon um we're going to put everything back together and you know maybe i'll, I'll you know i'll do some time lapses and you know I'll, you know talk kind of like i'm talking now about what we're doing and what the process was like and and hopefully it all goes well because we got you know we got to put it all together test it uh, make sure everything works the way we need it to work and it's just a lot of cables a lot of electronics a lot of everything and we have always um you know been pretty old school when it comes to recording you know we started out analog uh, haven't always recorded to digital we do now of course we record to pro tools but Pro Tools, digital, that's come a long way. We started out back in the day recording to two-inch uh, two analog tape, usually Studer machines, 24 tracks, sometimes, um, sometimes the 16 tracks. We'll do drums and slow it down and then transfer that. So we've done all the iterations of, of, of analog. And... The, we moved to when we got our own studio, the clubhouse in Bremerton, Washington, uh, where actually where the where our uh, merch, the merch arsenal is right now. That's where the studio used to be. So now it's our merch warehouse. But so when we got that place, we started out with eight at machines. We had these eight ats, which are basically like v VHS tapes, but recording onto audio, not video. Um, and you you rewind them, you forward them, so it works like a tape machine where you have to have like location numbers and points and, and all that. Um, and then you got to punch in like like just like an analog machine. So we were familiar with punching in because we had been in studios, you know, 
recording records, um, probably knew more about punching in than we knew about actually playing our instruments. But uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, that we started out with that. Um, when we moved on from that, we got a Mackie, uh, Mackie HDR 24 recorder, which is their first digital recording system. You're recording to hard drives, these big, chunky hard drives that come, you know, go into a bay and you can have different ones with different albums and stuff. And you could send this down to LA and be like, this is a Mackie HDR 24 hard drive, you know, and then they can transfer that to Pro Tools or whatever was being used at the time. We didn't quite have Pro Tools yet when we started out, but we did that Mackie HDR 24 for quite a while. Uh, to go along with that, we had a digital console. We had the, the Digital 8 bus console, the high, you know, whatever that really funky looking spaceship console was where it had flying faders that would move around. We're like, whoa, that's so cool. So we made the Renaissance EP on that. It sounds, of course, a little weird and like we don't know what we're doing, but we're just like, all right, well, it's done, right? Yeah, we recorded, we mixed it. All right, cool. Didn't know anything. Didn't know what I was doing at all. All right, but anyway, moving on, we eventually, um, we started working with like Stefan Edgerton on a bunch of things, and he's like, you got to get Pro Tools, man. You got to get Pro Tools. All right, let's get Pro Tools. So we, he found us this turnkey rig. We basically bought it in L.A., got shipped up. It was a rack amount, or just like a tall, I would say f almost five-foot uh, rack full of of digi design uh it was it, it was like digi design stuff and um 888s and all this old stuff like that we didn't really use but we also got these 88000s which were the apogee um d to a converters or a to d converters sorry both kind of but a to d converters which is analog to digital converters and those were better sounding than the digi design converters they had an analog vibe to it, right? Like you could, and you could pad it with some like distort, some like analog kind of like distortion or whatever, not distortion, but like, I don't know, like this, like, you know, how, how tape has a hiss to it, right? Um, or, or not, not even the hiss. I'm not talking about that sound of it, but like the, the warmth that people talk about analog having, that's what this is meant to have is not such a hard number digital uh, signal. And that's the thing about recording with digital in the early days. Those, those, those sounds often sounded digital because, like, I wasn't even using auto tune, and it would sound like auto tune because of the waveform and it being a digital representation of what the analog thing was. So you're going from this micro, you know, voice to microphone into a, an electrical current, a vibration, if you will. Uh, up the, the to the cable up to your preamp and your preamp takes this signal this left you know this uh negative and positive signal and the neutral signal in it and it uh well it's, i don't think neutral has a signal but uh it grounds it and then it takes that and amplifies it through these you know i don't even know i don't really know how all this stuff works and how do you get from the analog to the digital right how do you get how do you get to an mp3 from me talking that's wild and you can just literally do it on your phone right so we've come a long way but back then everything sounded worse it sounded terrible like there wasn't you got to think about it too like the bit rate was so much lower um there was so now you know cds are 44.1 44.1 hertz and uh most videos or VHS audio you hear is 48 hertz. And that's that's the top of the range back in the day. And then, you know, you get analog and you get so, so much more rich sound because it's a waveform like this. This is analog. And what a digital waveform looks like is blocks. Think of blocks going up and down. Do, 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 do. So you, what you want is you want more of those blocks to fit into the same amount of space, smaller blocks, so that they can make a smoother looking waveform. And that's what it means to go from 441 up to 48. 
And then from there up to like, say, 96, 7, 96 points. I don't know what the what the radio station is up there. 96, some 96 K, basically 96 K. Uh, uh, I might might have been saying that wrong is maybe it's K and not Hertz, but let's not get into you know what I mean, right? Like, let's not get into the details of that. Uh, because yeah, but it's 44 one. And then the more you go up, the more of these digital blocks are actually making up the sound. And the more you have, the smoother that sounds. So back when you would sing and it's auto, like it would sound like auto tune, even if it wasn't auto tune because the, the lack of, of bit rate or the lack of freak, you know, yeah. So you get that spinning faster and faster. So you go from 441 up to like 96 it's going faster. You're, 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 it's almost, think of it like, um, like frame rate on a camera, right? 24 frames per second is what standard movies are. And you get that like kind of flow. But if you go down to like where they started in Hollywood, you know, when they're making like Godzilla, Hong Kong movies, or King Kong movies, Godzilla would be sort of Hong Kong, but it'd be like Tokyo. But um, what I mean is back then those cameras were, were less bit rate. So it was like, instead of, or the frame per second was less. So it was analog. We're talking analog back then. Um, so it would be, instead of 24 frames per second, it would be 16. And then further back, you go eight frames per second. And they probably have like two frames per second, right? Or one frame per second. But that's frame. And then the next one, you know, so you're like seeing, so you can imagine if you take that, speed it up, 24 frames, 24 of those. So you have to have, you know, and, and that makes up, that makes up what you see. And then finally you see like, oh, I see somebody coming to life. But when you slower it down, it, you're frozen, you know, each thing. Same thing with with the degradation of audio sounding. You know, the, the more you you squeeze your audio and MP3, MP3s are amazing you know, but they do sound worse than waves. I mean, it's just, it's a fact. You have more memory in this wave file. It's a bigger file than you have in an MP3 file, which is tiny. You're going to, it's going to sound better. Now there are exceptions. Now and again, you have a song that just sounds better with a crappy MP3 mix or something like that, but a rendering, but, um, few and far between, few and far between. All right. Uh, I, that was a fun conversation. That was that was good, but uh, <laughs> I didn't expect to talk about digital and analog. Did I did I miss anything? Did I leave anything out? I don't know, um, but I hope I hope I explained that a little bit. And so now we're now we're in in a place where people don't even mind hearing a digital sound, like they're used to hearing a vocal sound digital. Now and again, you hear some like punk purist that only wants records that are recorded to vinyl and <laughs> recorded straight to vinyl and there's no autotune and if they hear something that sounds a little like autotune they're going to be mad but that's just kind of how things sound digitally even without autotune like i was saying earlier some frequencies some waveforms just have a weird a weird thing to it and then you get different frequencies on the album or on the song clashing together in a weird way just in that one bit and then they open up. Like you get weird things that happen. Phantom sounds. Um, I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've we're like listening back to things, a mix, a mastering, and like that. And then you go back and you listen to it, and you're like, I didn't hear what I heard, you know. And sometimes there's a glitch, even even before your recordings. You got to make sure anything you hear. Is just a what it, is just a glitch and not actually on the tape or not actually because you hear a little pop sometimes. Um, you don't want those to be there every single time. So um, it reminds me of old mixtapes I used to have. There would be like there would be like bits cut out of songs because like I don't know like radio stations were doing it or this or that. But like be like wait where did I get this song? Where's this song? This is like a bootlegged song on my mixtape which is also a bootleg, but I digress. Let's get to the next, the next caller. Hey, Mike, this is William from Birmingham. Uh, I'm glad that you, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that you spread these voicemails out so it doesn't like it. 
so I don't sound like a crazy person calling you all the time. But uh, this is my last question for you um, for 2023. Um, I'm curious to know what genres of music you're into that you don't get to talk about all the time. So um, obviously punk rock is your thing, and uh, I know you dabble in country. Um, but what else do you like? Do you like any uh, – do you listen to any – Pop, outside of punk, uh, any electronic stuff, classical music. I want to know what you like. Um, yeah, so for me, I, I love punk rock, obviously, MXDX, Goldfinger, Teenage Bottle Rocket, um, Chicks Dig It, if you've heard of them. Um, but then I also love the, <laughs> the Norwegian pop band AHA. So uh, I saw them in California last year, and it was just incredible. I um, also love some dance music like Dead Mouse and Daft Punk. Yeah, so uh, let, let me know what else you like to listen to um, outside of what you're kind of known for. Have a good one. It's not a bad question. Um, thanks for calling, William. And uh, it's 2024 now, so you can call back in anytime. Maybe you already did. <laughs> I get I get lost in these voicemails so uh but uh I appreciate it. So what do I listen to besides punk rock? I do listen to mostly punk rock. Um I listen to rock. I listen to post I mean, you know, hardcore, a little bit of hardcore here and there. Um I don't really I mean I don't listen to like one artist, to be honest. I listen to some, I do the thing that I don't like people to do, which is like I listen to like one song by by a lot of artists, but not with punk rock. With punk rock, I listen to a lot of albums, like Mercy Music. I listen to like the whole album or something. But, um, but yeah, I mean, with with new different genres that I'm not fully immersed in all the time i do just tend to like like a song so let's see i like yes i like country music i don't like all country music um but i like i like the sound some of the sounds and some of the voices you know just they sound great if it's a great song um I, I, there's too many to name as far as like country artists and stuff but like somebody kind of recent that just blew up out of out of nowhere really Oliver Anthony, I only know the one song, maybe two songs I've seen, you know, heard from them, and they're both really good, and, and they're just great songs, but uh, Richmond from North, North uh, Richmond from North, uh, Richmond, um, so <laughs> North of Richmond, that's what it is, so I had to look it up, Richmond, Richmond North of Richmond um, is the name of the song, and it, it, it's a huge song, and it's a great song, and I think the reason why it became so big is just because it resonated with so many people. People are tired and people are feeling like, like, uh, the rules sticking by the rules don't, don't work for them. You know what I mean? And then of course, if you don't stick by the rules then that really doesn't work cause then you go to jail, but whatever that is, you know, whatever that is about, about what's going on in this country, especially, but also the world, you know, it's not just this country. But there's just so many problems, and what is that? What's that negative frequency that's been going on, and and can we turn that around? And we certainly, we certainly feel like, like things aren't going the way we want them to. You know, economy-wise, um, w- all these wars continually happening. Like. I, when I was a kid, I thought, okay, eventually wars is going to be done. Like we won't, we won't have war anymore because people are going to realize that that just doesn't ever fix things. And no, sadly, sadly, that's that's not the world we live in. And, and I understand that now. Obviously, there's going to be war, but at the same time, I don't want it. Don't I don't, I don't want to just accept it. So, Richmond, North of Richmond, is a it's a, it's a song for everyone. It's not a, a right or a left song. It's a song for everyone because everyone except the top of the top people, people with uh, all the power in this country, in this world, um, that send people, you know, send our sons and daughters into war, you know, like they're, 
they're going to be fine. You know, they're, they're always going to be fine, but not so, not the same way. Like what, what's happened to the middle class in this country? It's, it's completely been decimated. Um, I feel like I used to be like pretty well off, you know, as far as like a person, you know, doing a job and having a business. And now I'm literally like probably like lower middle class or something like it's just it's just a different world that we live in. And songs that I can tune into like that really, really make a difference. Now, that's not for everybody because. I also love songs that don't make me think about the world at all. I love songs that that uh, help me just power up my energy. I love songs that make me feel good. I love songs that make me feel powerful, that give me uh, energy. And like I just said that three times, I think. Uh, but uh, songs that that are purely to get you motivated. Like I like songs like that. And I like to write songs like that. Um, so it's not always about pushing those uncomfortable buttons and, and being pushed. Like I do, I do like feel good stuff too. So, um, punk rock though. I mean, I'm from punk rock and I've always been a questioner. I've always been on the outside looking in. I've always kind of been wondering, Hey, what's going on in there? Not because I want to be part of the club, but because I want to know what the hell is going on in there. And, you know, but that's the thing is like at the same time, you know, that's a very key about me. That's, that's my personality in a nutshell is like, I do not, I'm not a club guy. Like I, I have, I have a lot of friends. I have different friends from different walks of life. They're part of clubs and they're part of the, you know, the big club. I've always just kind of, my club is, is MXPX. Like my band is a club. And that's about it. But these guys, you know, my band, we're here to play music. We're here to feel good. We're here to have a great time. Um, but then, you know, we all go our, our separate ways throughout the days and throughout the weeks or whatever. But it's not the same thing. You know, we're not getting together. We're not getting together going, all right, MXPX guys, what can we do to um, make sure that everybody loves MXPX and hates Anybody that doesn't like we're not really thinking about it in like a political term or like, you know, how you would in business. And that's probably naive and probably stupid because we are in a business and it's a cutthroat business and people stab each other in the back all the time. And but no, we want to help people. People ask for us. To, we, we ask people for help because we we need it. And, and we also want people to ask us for help. You know, you know, you, there's a. We want to help our friends that help us and, and vice versa, right? Like you would think you would think that. And I think all of our friends have been great. Like whenever we actually take the time to communicate to each other, it's a good response. It's it's when you're in your castle alone and you're just like, man, what happened? They slammed the door. They really don't like me. And then you got like Kirby enthusiasm. I was just watching that the other day. He's slamming doors. Larry David is slamming doors. But he's not realizing he's slamming the doors. And every time he slams the door and he leaves, he's like just walking away, blah, 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 blah. And the people inside are like, is he mad? And so it's like messing up all his business deals and, and it's hilarious. Anyway, I haven't even finished the episode, but it's last season, they got a new season coming up. No, I do not work for them. No, they did not pay me to say that. But I, I am a huge Curb Your, Your Enthusiasm fan. Love it. Anyway, uh, yeah. I don't know if I've answered your question, but um, a little bit. Okay, let me let me give you a few more. Okay, so uh, Oliver Anthony. Um, I haven't even really listened to that song too much lately, but I did add it to my library. Um, and if you haven't added our new album to your library, please, for the love of God, you listen to my podcast, you should have our new album. Even if you don't constantly listen to it, add it there. Um, H2O, love them. I know they're punk rock, hardcore. Um, hate breed, gotta love it. <laughs> Justin Bieber, a couple of songs I love of his. Um, I just like, I like some, some just good songs, just some good performances too. Like he really has some cool ideas. Um, love myself being one of those. Um, great song. Um, but there's another one. There's another one. Can't remember what it's called. But um, 
man, Lonely. That song, Lonely, is so good. Lonely. So he sang that on Saturday Night Live. And he walked around, not just the front, but he walked through the hallway of Saturday Night Live while he was singing the song. And it was, and the guy, and there was a guy playing piano. So it's just piano and vocal. And it was like, wow. That's an amazing performance. Like, I was like, my hat's off to you, sir. You know, 10 years ago, I still probably wasn't mature enough to, to admit to anybody that I liked Justin Bieber or, you know, I don't know anything about his personality and I don't follow that. So, like, don't even, don't bother with that. Like, honestly, I just listen to the song and if I like it, I like it. <sighs> All right. Oh, Benny Blanco. That's the other dude. No wonder he's dating uh, somebody super famous right now. This song, I know it's gonna get pulled, but I'll just play the very beginning. Everybody knows my name now, but something about it still feels strange. All right, I can't play anymore because I'll definitely pull this thing. But uh, for YouTube, if you're watching on YouTube, um, yeah. Uh, what else? I like, I like uh, a lot of random stuff, really. Um, I don't spend a ton of time just listening to music daily. I get on kicks or I find a song and I f always usually find it uh, either organically or through friends. But um, Tom Chichilla and Tom Wisniewski both send me songs all the time. Um, but I can't say they're not punk rock songs or in the rock genre because most of them are, are, are in that that they send. But... I like hip hop. I like, you know, all the all the classic hip hop people I like. Uh yeah, nothing crazy. Um I'm I know I'm forgetting some amazing artists and songs, but um yeah, Willie Nelson. Saw him my wife and I went to see him in Dallas a couple of years ago on not on his birthday, I don't think. It was just a regular show date, but it was it was a beautiful show. It was it was so much fun. I've seen him a couple times now, but um, I saw BB King and Etta James uh, before he passed, and I think Etta James passed. Um, she passed much lo further back, you know, she, a, lo a lot longer. Not further back, but she she passed a lot a lot later after I saw her play with with BB King. Um, she lived quite a while, but um, but I think she did pass. So yeah, I mean, seeing, you know, I saw Tom Petty at the Gorge. Um, pretty sure that's the only time I saw him. I wanted to see him again. You know, there's artists that that just you know, I just want to see. You know, and, and I want to see everybody. I want. I don't just want to see artists that might die, but I want to see anybody that's good. Anybody that's good, I want to see them live because it's such an experience. When you're there with the audience, you're there with all these people that have this energy. It's not the same as listening in your bedroom. It's not the same as listening in the car. It might be akin to listening to one of your favorite songs with all your friends in a car driving down the road, screaming the song together. Like that's, that's some good energy, right? Good energy. I mean, uh, you can't get any better than just being in a huge, a big crowd of people that all love the same band or artist that you love and you're just having a moment together and you know that, hey, yeah, this, what's happening right now is never going to happen the same exact way ever again. And that's why I love live music. That's why I love playing live shows and doing the thing. I love it. That's why I even like doing live streams because that live stream, yeah, it can be replayed on YouTube and all that, but it ain't, there's an energy that gets lost. Like the energy of live is still there on our live stream shows on the internet, live on the internet. It's amazing to me, but it really is. When you're watching live, there's energy there. Energy is the word of the day. That's the name of this episode, energy. There's energy there. move on hi mike this is josh from gross yet again with a couple more questions um growing up one of my favorite albums 
was let it happen. So I was wondering what, if you could elaborate on what Small Town Minds is about. As someone who grew up in a small town, I think my hometowns are like population like 300 right now, so very small town, and I definitely encountered some small minds. So I'm wondering what your experience was to write Small Town Minds. And also, when you talk about let it happen, usually you talk about how it wasn't a proper album. It was just kind of a compilation of some different B-sides and demos and stuff and how it you felt like Tooth and Nail kind of used it to muddy the waters of slowly going the way of the buffalo. So I was wondering if there's anything good that you could say about let it happen. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for calling, Josh. Let it happen. Um, yeah, I could, let me say something good, and then I'll get into... I'll get into more. Um, so, what was I going to say about it? I mean, let it happen. I, I, The good thing I can say about it is I really like the song Let It Happen. A Small Town Minds. Okay, I got to make sure I don't remember. Or don't forget. I don't remember. I don't forget. Uh, don't forget to remember. Um, Small Town Minds. So, what I like about it is I love the song Let It Happen. I love a couple songs on there, but Let It Happen is just like I love the lyrics. I love the the bass line. You know, it's just, it's cool. It's chill. It's It's got a good vibe. I really, I can't say, can't say I don't like it. I wish we had recorded like a proper version, but at the same time, yeah, at this point, it doesn't matter. I'm happy with it. I'm good. Thank you. Um, Small Town Minds. What does it mean to me? Well, at the time, we were blowing up. We were on tour all the time. We would come back and just hear rumors and hear, you know, hear the people were just talking shit. And they would, all these different things would be started about us. We're this, we're that, we're assholes, we're, you know, this, you know, just like we, you know, we're terrible for one. It's like, okay, that might be the truest thing about us. But my reaction was to write a song called small town minds because we live in a small town bremerton was a small town back then like when you go to seattle you, you'd say you're from bremerton and you're like ooh, like that's not a cool place but if you're from bremerton and, and people are from shelton that's like even smaller right shelton washington like that's where the real hicks are but we had plenty of hicks out in seabeck out in the outskirts of bremerton um and so, and it wasn't about Hicks, by the way. The, the song itself was about a lot of music people, a lot of punk people, a lot of skateboarders and punkers, people that were in the music scene, other band people, and they were jealous. They were jealous that MXPX was doing well, and they were like, why are these guys doing well? Because we were working. We, were, we, we got lucky, sure. We got signed. We met the right people and got lucky that way because most of life is all about connections and relationships and who you know and 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 the fact that we we played with this band that knew uh the guy that owned Tooth and Nail Records and and wanted to hear more and so it was just yeah we we got lucky but at the same time we worked and we did the work and we were in the right place at the right time we were like playing these little parties in Seattle and and doing all this stuff so i know this shouldn't be about defending myself from these small town minds cats but they didn't know what we were doing. They just saw that we were doing well, and they were jealous. So my reaction was to write a song called Small Town Minds. Uh, try to forget. Try, wait, what is I don't even remember how that song goes, to be honest. I'll look it up. Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, I'll look it up. But But the song to me was just about how people will gossip, people will talk shit, People will will be the worst kind of people because that's what people do, you know. You live in a small town, right? So, um, sorry, this thing's freaking out. I'm trying to get rid of it. All right, here we go. Back at it. Um, so let me look this up. Let it happen. It's a Tame Impala song. <laughs> uh, 
that's funny. You can't. There's just not. There's nothing. There's nothing you can't have on your own. I mean, there might be a couple things. Um. Okay, let's find it. Is it under album? All right, here it is. So, small town, small minds. Okay, here we go. Does this instrumental bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, here we go. Um, No, it's still not going yet. I'm going to wait until I start singing and I'll put it up. All right. Here we go. So I'm sitting here thinking, I'm sitting here saying, you're the least of my problems. I won't give you the time. You're the least of my worries. You're not worth your weight. Let me look up the rest of the lyrics. Where are the lyrics? I didn't have the lyrics on here. That's annoying. That is annoying. I guess we didn't give Tooth and Nail the lyrics. Ha. 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 No, no, no. It's pulling them up. I'm pulling them up. All right, so here it is. You're the least of my problems. I won't give you the time. You're the least of my worries. You're not worth your weight. I'll bet everything I have that you'll be there to have what you call fun, but I don't care. Meaning in front of the crowd at our show, flipping us off or whatever. Um, But I don't care. Small town, small minds. This means you. Small town, small minds, you don't have a clue. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I wrote those lyrics, and I absolutely was giving them my time. I was giving them my energy. We had a whole song about them. But they don't know who they were because I didn't name them personally. Um, to the haters, to whom to whom they may be. But, uh, that, yeah, I like that song. That's actually a pretty cool song. Um, we did that. Fairly recently, in the last five years, I thought we did live. I thought we even did it at a live stream because we'll do some really deep cuts when we do live shows on the internet. And uh, that might have been one of them. Anyway, I hope I talked about Let It Happen enough to make you think that I absolutely don't completely hate it. Um, what I did right there isn't, isn't going to help me at all. I would rather you listen to the new album. I would rather you listen to anything in the last five years, to be honest. Uh, not not that I don't want you to listen to all their old stuff. Please do. Like I say, like listen to whatever you want. But if you want to help the band, listen to the new stuff because we own the new stuff. Um, times are tough. Hey, what you going to do? Play the new stuff. All right, let's get to the next one. Hey. Hi. Hi. Love your show. I love your show. Thank you. MXPX is awesome. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks for calling. Thanks for the love. Um, it always feels good to get some high praise. I appreciate that. Let's get to the next one. Uh, yo, Mike. This is Eric calling from Philly. Uh, super pumped to see you guys in town in a couple of weeks. Actually, uh, I think I'm, I may have been among the first to pick up tickets for that show. I was online second after they went on sale. And told my students they would have to chill out for a few minutes. Um, in terms of cheesesteaks in town, there really is no wrong way to go. It just kind of depends on what you prefer. They all have kind of like slightly different thicknesses, cheeses, uh, rolls. I'm a Pax man myself, but uh, I think the best way to go is just taste test all of them. <laughs> um, I had a question about the song Late Again off of Panic, one of my favorite albums. Um, that song has, uh, to me, like a real kind of country vibe to it, like almost atypical of a lot of other MXPX songs. Um, and to me, it actually sounds almost a little bit more like a tumble down song. I'm wondering if you could just speak to, you know, the process of when you're writing and putting a song together, how you determine, you know, which band is going to is going to get that song. Uh, so anything you can you know you can say on that would be awesome. And uh, again, can't wait to see you boys in a couple of weeks. Peace. Cool, dude. Thanks, Eric. Um, I wish 
I had found this voicemail before the Philly show because the Philly show already happened. And I hope I had some pats because I'm recording this right before the show. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but I hope you ha- I hope you had a great time. Now, late again. Um, easy enough answer, I think, on that one. Late again came out. I don't know, was that 2015, somewhere in there? Maybe it was 2014. And that was right after Tumble Down was kind of like not really doing much. We weren't doing anything. Uh, 2013, we played our last show. And we haven't played since. So, uh, but our guitar player, Jack Parker, was playing with me a bit. So I actually had him come in and play guitar on Late Again. He did the solo. He did, you know, some stuff throughout the, you know, the song. And I think that's why it sounds a lot like Tumble Down. Because it's got Tumble Down riffs. It's got our guitar player that plays, you know, he's got, you know, six or seven riffs. And then you just rinse and repeat and change it up a little bit. Uh, (laughs) But uh, that was, you know, it made sense that way. And and to me, when I was writing the song, I, I wasn't thinking Tumble Down at all. I was thinking... I was thinking this has got like a Dropkick Murphys vibe to it. It's got a Flogging Molly vibe to it where it's like a, an, an almost like an Irish punk song. But we knew we were going to do just, we were going to do the song, but without Irish instruments. And so maybe that even makes it sound more like Tumble Down because it doesn't have the Irish instruments or anything like that. It's just, you know, late again, forgive me, friends. It's a drinking song I wrote. It's basically a drinking song. Um, but, you know, you don't want to constantly just sing songs about drinking. So it's a, a song about me being late a lot. Um, but it's more of that. You know, it's got some life stuff in there. But it's, it's I, I really like how that came out. Um, but I wonder if that makes more sense now, now that you know few more details all right let's do a couple more hey mike what's up uh i don't know if you remember me this is jason the singer of that old tooth and nail band bloodshed and i'm listening to your dingy's podcast right now and uh it just made me think of um i remember playing with you guys when teenage politics came out and we were playing this empty parking lot of a record store i think and you were, like, in the front. You were just right up to the stage, and I thought that was so cool. But anyways, hope you're doing good, man. Late. Jason, dude, you were so cool back in the day. I'm sure you're cool now, too. Uh, <laughs> thanks for calling in. Um, I do kind of remember that a little bit. Like, I just remember, like, a little vignette, a few vignettes from you guys. But um, you guys were always wearing, you were always wearing a white t-shirt or maybe that was the video or the picture I saw of you, the very first thing. But I just remember Brandon Ebel bringing your CD. Maybe it was like, it wasn't even out yet. He's like, check this out. He's like, this kid is like 16 or 14. Like he was, I don't know. How, we were 16. So you, we were probably like 17 at the time. So you were probably younger, uh, but you were real young, just like this little kid and we were all just like blown away by how cool it was that this little kid is singing for this hardcore band. Bloodshed was awesome. They were, they were a great band, and, and I really thought you guys had some great energy. I hate to bring up energy again, but you guys had great energy. Thanks for calling in, Josh. I'm not Sorry, not Josh, Jason. My bad. Uh, let's get to the last one. Hey, Mike, this is Jason from uh, Laverne, California, right next door to San Dimas, California. Uh, Been a long, long, long time fan. Uh, Discovered you guys many years ago at a display case that featured uh, your Poconatcha CD, Blenderhead, Prime Candidate for Burnout, and Focused, and Crucified, who I was familiar with, so I had to buy all those CDs, and people say don't judge a CD cover by its cover, and I'm happy I was right about you guys and Blenderhead. Those are great albums. Uh, saw you guys on tour with Blenderhead and Crucified many, many, many years ago. So I've been a long time fan and long time listener. Finally calling. Uh, quick question. Uh, many years ago, like I said, long time fan. Uh, I saw you guys play at Knott's Berry Farm. Um, mm-hmm. I think that was where I bought the Teenage Politics CD. I don't know if it was like a CD release show or something there, but uh, any stories about playing at Knott's Berry Farm backstage? Uh, there was no internet back then, so there was rumors going around 
that day, but people were saying that you guys graduated high school the day before and flew down to SoCal to play the show. Just wondering that was hanging out with my old friend uh, Andre, a.k.a. Armdre, who you guys knew back then. Uh, also my buddy James, who was in the uh, uh, Teenage Politics video. I was going to be in that. I had a, couldn't get a ride to where the location was at. So I um, uh, appreciate you guys. Was at the L.A. show. Uh, it was a great show. Um, love seeing you guys. But I, you guys put on an amazing show in L.A. Um, keep up the good work, and you guys are amazing. Thank you, bye. Jason, dude, thank you so much for calling. That that just blew my mind. You said you were a fan from back in the day, but you literally saw our first tour, our first real tour. So we had gone, we had been playing. We had been playing Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, B.C., Cal, even Southern California, we had flown down during the school year and played. But you almost have a couple things mixed up because Knott's Berry Farm, that rumor was true, but not that show. We had flown, we, we, had, we had come down two days after our graduation and we shot, a, the day after our graduation, we shot the Wanted video in Seattle. Shot that video Went home back to Bremerton, slept. The next day, drove to Southern California and shot Punk Rock Show. We shot all the regular stuff first, and then we started the tour with Blenderhead, our first tour ever, where we played with the Crucified, I want to say in somewhere in L.A. or Orange County, uh... I don't, at some club, and, and there's footage of the club footage from the Punk Rock Show video is our show. And if you saw that show with the Crucified, is either that one or it was maybe um, one a little bit north, like in the Bay Area, but like one of those two shows was like literally like the first or second show of our tour. And if you saw that show with the, with the Crucified, wherever in SoCal, you literally saw the first show of the tour. You saw the show where we shot Punk Rock Show, the video, and it became like, you know, and we embarked on this great adventure in our lives where we're still on it now, and I still play in the same band. Like, it's just wild. Like, that's a huge milestone that you were, you were part of there. That's very cool, Jason. So that... That rumor at Knott's Berry Farm was just a late rumor because the internet, you know, to, you know, there was no internet back then. And so it took a long time for those rumors to get there. And so I think that must have been at least a year or two later where we played Knott's Berry Farm for what was it, The Life in General or whatever album was out. Um, who knows? But wow, blast from the past. And and the fact that you came and saw us just last month headlining the, the Palladium in Hollywood, that, that blows me away. And I hope hope you felt good when you're just like, man, I saw their first tour with the Crucified and Blenderhead, and I didn't even really know who they were. I just kind of like had just gotten into them, and, and now I'm seeing them 31 years later, or probably less than 31 years later, I guess, because 31 years is 1992 when we actually started the band. But... um. We're thinking, this is probably 1995, right after we had graduated, we're on our first tour, and, and then the fact that we could still be doing it all these years later and, and headlining a, such a huge place in Hollywood, that's, it's kind of blowing my mind. It's amazing, and, and thank you, and people like you, everybody listening, thank you all, because I, it's the audience that makes people special. Like, an artist isn't, isn't special unless there's an audience, Right. Uh, maybe that's the wrong way to think about it because you can have you can be a great artist and not have a large audience, I guess. But um, I think you know what I mean. You know, uh, we we serve at the pleasure of our audience. You know, we're out here for you. So um, I appreciate you. I appreciate you a lot. That was a great way to end this. Um, I went way long. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you. Uh, Hope you guys have a great week or wherever you are. Um, please call in. The number again is 360-830-6660. Call in, leave a message, do your thing. Uh, would love to hear from, from some ladies. And um, more kids. More kids can call in too. 
Let me know what your favorite song is. Let me know what the first time you heard MXPX was like and any other kind of crazy things like that. I would love to hear. All right, y'all. Until next week, um, I will talk to you soon. Peace. Oh, before we go, of course, MXPX.com. We have tickets available for uh, Atlanta, Georgia, March 15th, and Orlando at the House of Blues, March 16th. Um, MXPX.com. MXPX and the Ataris are going to be playing. It's going to be great. And then Denver and Salt Lake City, April 5th and 6th, sold out. So I don't need to say too much about that, although I am looking forward to it. It's going to be awesome, both shows. It's going to be a great weekend. Um, And then more coming up. I'll be announcing more. We'll be talking about more, including Mexico and stuff like that. All right. Shout out to Bob McKnight. Thanks for producing. Thanks for doing your thing. And thanks for um, just all the hard work you've put in on this podcast. Um, Check out his podcast. It's called The Bob and Katie Show. He does it. And it's just him and his wife are are funny. They're great. They're salt of the earth, earth people. Amazing. So thanks, Bob. And thanks thanks to everybody for listening. Appreciate it. All right. Peace out.